Among the British soaps, there's this notion that Coronation Street is the funny one, with its homespun northern wisdom, and characters often more cartoonish than their gruff southern counterparts. Some scenes are closer to outright sitcom than tea time kitchen sink drama. She lived on a tugboat. It was a barge. Although, next to the perpetual misery of East Enders, awaking in a mass grave, crushed beneath the freshly rotting bodies of your loved ones, would probably seem like a right laugh too. I think this perception is why the thing I'm talking about today exists. Racking up thousands of episodes every week for decades, soaps can't be released on DVD the same as other shows as box sets would break the postman's back. But there have been plenty of related releases over the years, with best ofs, retrospectives, and special, exclusive episodes never shown on television. Corey had a bunch of these one-off, straight-to-VHS specials, each like those film versions of 70s sitcoms, sending the cast to dick around in various foreign locales, specifically South Africa, Romania, Vegas, written by Russell T. Davis, and a cruise on the QE2. The final of these self-contained specials came with 2010's A Knight's Tale, essentially a spin-off movie putting wacky comedy characters Curly Watts and Reg Holdsworth in a gothic castle for the weekend during a medieval convention. Described as a comedy of errors, this sounds made up, but I swear it's an actual thing. Easties did some of their own, including one called Slater's in Detention, which honestly looks like a bluey. The cover's got the four sisters in school uniforms, with a plot where they end up sharing a prison cell on a wild night out. Who's the warder, Ben Dover? The Mitchell brothers got a similar video in the late 90s, Again, going for that X-rated, too hot for TV vibe, with the title Naked Truths, although it mostly consisted of the pair sat talking in an empty Queen Vic. So if you're expecting to see a bit of Belle, you'll be disappointed. Though they did have a little dance to Kung Fu fighting with their shirts off, for all the mums. Admittedly, these are only loosely connected with what I'm talking about here, which is such an oddity it has no real comparison. Liz Dawn's House Party, also known on Amazon as Liz Dawn Right Up Your Street, was released on VHS in 1996. Liz is best known for playing Coronation Street's Vera Duckworth, undoubtedly one of its most iconic characters, and one of the more comedy-leaning ones. But she's not Vera here, she's herself, although the difference between the two is pretty negligible. A 50-minute curio. From the off, House Party really plays up that aforementioned idea of earthy northern hospitality. Oh, are you, kid? Oh, I'm glad you could come. Here, come inside and meet rest at guests. The comparisons with Alan Partridge's Knowing Me, Knowing You are unavoidable. Is this Liz Dawn's real house? I've got to get me some of that Cory money. So what guests are we going to see? I'll let the intro speak for itself. Cultured. Cultured. You must know cultured people. I mean, Carol, can't you put your brass here in any tighter? I'm having a lovely time here. I haven't come with Derek. You know why I'm here, Liz? What a cast. Eagle-eyed viewers will spot more famous faces in the background. Like Lee Sharp. Armando Iannucci and Elton John. With such a collection of the rich and powerful, this has to be the late 90s British Illuminati. This lot were pulling the strings, getting Blair elected and keeping Chris Evans at the top. As told by Jimmy Cricket in the intro, everyone's gathered for Liz's birthday. But it can't just be a party, there has to be a story and we're treated to an actual flashback, set at breakfast that very morning. <laughs> Unbelievably weird, 
It's presented as a comedy sketch with canned laughter over the top. That fella's Liz's husband, Don. Then the postman arrives and it's Jimmy Cricket. Listen to Jimmy's joke here. The worst joke ever told. For now. Yeah, well I left my postman's job and got a job as a milkman, but I got the sack on the first day. Oh, what for? Well, I dropped the milk bottles through the letter boxes. <laughs> if you fit a glass bottle through the slot? Come on, postman, got the sack. There's loads to work with there. <laughs> Jimmy runs through a whole routine on the doorstep. <laughs> this is from my niece. She's one of Sammy's twins. <laughs> I did wonder if they drafted in an actor to play her retired electrician husband, Don. Judging by his performance, what do you reckon? Dance! Do I have a little set of darts? You're always going on about luxury flights, aren't you? You can't get better than that the real girls have it. What's even going on here? Butler! Have you lost your marbles? We can't afford a butler! He's only here for the day. I want him in a raffle at the club. <laughs> It's the over-the-top canned laughter that makes it really unsettling. Like one of those postmodern parodies of sitcom domesticity. Who wrote this? Tim Heidecker. Are they going to open the airing cupboard and reveal Jack Duckworth with slugs for eyebrows? It feels like a backdoor pilot for a series. Even establishing there's a neighbour they don't get on with. Yeah. Wait till she hears about it. Her next door, stuck up cow. As we return to the present, Liz launches into a stand-up set. Her deliveries, well... Some of them can't come, you know, like my old mate Joan Collins. <laughs> she's been on my back for a week. Still, it's nice to know that she's, you know, working again. <laughs> the material, something else too. Like this anecdote about Paul Daniels at her last party. I said, you can't blame the dog, can you, if you're going to turn up with wearing a wig that looks like a dead squirrel? <laughs> Check out this shameless cribbing of one of the most famously succinct put-downs of the last 30 years. But his wife, that lovely Debbie McGee. Uh, do you know how a millionaire like him could get a lovely girl like that? I don't know. <laughs> but what first, Debbie, attracted you to the millionaire Paul Daniels? <laughs> And what party's complete without a chummy gag about a notorious dead paedophile? Cyril so Smith can't come because, uh, well, he telephoned. He said he's uh, got chronic, uh, you know, incontinence. I said, I said, where are you ringing from? He said, to from West Ham. Still, it's good to see Les Dennis and Amanda Holden in better times. If this is the kind of dates he took her on, it's no wonder she ran off with Neil Morrissey. What you're seeing here is pretty much the whole show. Liz Dawn doing stand-up in a fake living room to the drunken stars of British Variety. And I, for the other side, looking like oh, oh, no. <laughs> The comedy Death Jam is interspersed with sketches, including a pre-tape with Lily Savage helping prepare the buffet. Hey, did you bring any lettuce? I knew I forgot something. I forgot. Which just increases the powerful Partridge vibes. Maybe this is all building to Vera going mad and decking Russell Grant with a turkey. Note that you could barely get a Rizzler between Lily's hair and the ceiling. Before more comedy about how she met Don, and a routine about dating. This is the 90s equivalent of a Netflix comedy special. But it were easy to get fellas in them days, wasn't it? All you had to do was have a bit of chip fat behind your ear, and you were irresistible. You kids now have got Dave Chappelle. But this is what we had back then. It were a Vickers and Tarts party <laughs> at the Grannies and Bottom Knockers Club. <laughs> Although I think Les has had enough. We cut to another sketch with camp astrologer Russell Grant. Do you believe in reincarnation? Well, I don't mind it on fruit salad, but I don't like it on <laughs> Some lovely nonsensical innuendo. Ooh. Oh, I can see that your planetary orbs are nicely in line. Well, they should be. I've only just bought this bra. <laughs> then it's back to the living room for more jokes about her terrible honeymoon. Look at the window. It's pissing down outside. That's all that's keeping them from escaping into the night. 
trapped in Liz Dawn's haunted castle like a 1940s horror, squashed on a sofa between Les Dennis and Faith Brown, waiting for the knock of the Grim Reaper. It was that damp, we put a mouse trap under the bed, and next morning we'd cut an errand. It's supposed to be a party, but how pissed off would you be if you got invited to someone's house and had to sit listening to their comedy routine? It's like when you've barely got your coat off before they've got the holiday snaps out. Or in this case, an old clip of them on the Larry Grayson show. I wore it years ago, you know, Larry Grayson's show. Did anybody see that? Oh, hello. I thought it was a leopard coming in. <laughs> At this point, Liz serenades the room with a song. Or as time rewritten every line. Can I just remind you this was released on home video? You could buy it in shops. Light the corners of my mind. You couldn't just stream things back then. You had to take it up to the counter and physically hand it to someone. Stand there while they rang it up on the till. Bloke behind you in the queue looking over your shoulder. But he didn't think it was weird because it was a totally normal thing to buy. Some people got this for Christmas or their birthday. People would have taken this from the bookshelf during a quiet evening and watched it again, having to run the tape back from last time. Shitting hell. Imagine sitting there. Imagine making eye contact with Vera as she's singing. Terrible eye contact. Would you like a bag, sir? Here's your receipt. Away we would. In another sketch, Liz visits a beautician. If you'll pardon the pun, here are the highlights. Uh, so, what else do you think I need? I've made a list. Feels like polyfiller. <laughs> We'd use polyfiller. Come <laughs> on, Rita. Not flaming trampoline. <laughs> Finally, the guests are released and permitted to mingle. Here, Liz falls into a pseudo-interview at the bar with a friend, which feels like a precursor to scripted reality TV, like a prehistoric TOWIE, with cameras voyeuristically catching the conversation from across the pool table. So, what was your first ever acting job? After all the clubs and all the singing and everything, what was your first big acting job? Which leads into an early clip, acting in an advert. Now put this on your head and don't worry about it. It's all torn between performance and career retrospective. A strange hybrid of an audience with, this is your life, and a morphine nightmare following a horrific motorcycle accident. Of course, they show an old clip from the street. I've got a clip of that. Hey, have a look at this. Playing up that Cory is the funny one thing I mentioned earlier. Once you add laughter to it, it really does feel like a sitcom. Uh, tea, Mr. Duckworth? Mrs. Atchley, man jam parted. Really? <laughs> Although if you did that with EastEnders, it would probably work too. See? Hilarious. Speaking of hilarious, there's a clip of Dustin G impersonating her. I'll tell you what, that Mike Baldwin, you know, I think he's after me. Historically, this is important, as it's where Les Dennis first solidified his lifelong brand as the bloke who goes. I don't really know. Fans of Les are in for a real treat, as he peels himself off the sofa for an impromptu family fortune skit. <laughs> Hold on, so the rest was rehearsed? You'll be telling us it's not really your birthday next. I do enjoy how Liz jumps here though. She's a tomato! Amanda Holden probably used this section to sneak off through the kitchen window. At your bowels, Les. <laughs> we looked for it and he got a. <laughs> But look at the casual, old pro way Liz slips into another number. You've won the piano! Oh! Me. 
seamless. There's a huge entertainment down at the old folks home feel, especially here. Come on, you know this, don't you? If you've been bad, really, really bad, really wicked, this party's where you go when you die. Jimmy Cricket, half sat on your lap. Vera off Corrie doing karaoke, pushing the mic at your mouth for you to join in. Why oh why did I do so many murders? Stood at heaven's gates, I beg a disinterested God for forgiveness, but he turns his back as Faith Brown gets up for some funny voices. The, 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 the milkmen can't take their eyes off you. <laughs> of course, we can't end without an appearance from on-screen husband Jack to give her what appears to be a giant penis. A soda fountain. Oh, right. Of course. And then, because of your sins in the earthly realm, this happens. Me. And my shadow. I thought I spotted Jeffrey Dahmer stood at the back, but it's not over yet as she gets Jack to do a solo number. The shadow of your smile. Outside of Corey, Bill Tarmy actually had a side career as a crooner, with some frankly phenomenal album covers. And the joys that love can bring. I will be remembering the shadow of your smile. They bring out a cake and sing happy birthday. Again, available to buy in the shops. I'm not saying we were lacking in content back then, but just before the 50 year sorry, 50 minute mark, the credits finally roll. Notice how some are listed as friends, while others merely as also appearing. I'd be right fucked off if I was Margie Clark. Also of interest if you follow my work, the show shares a director with Dream Stuffing and Russ Abbott's Madhouse. What a resume. God, this is all so odd. There's the strong feel and setup of a Christmas special. Except it's not Christmas. And even the picture on its IMDB page is confused. There's precious little information online. Leaving me with so many questions. Whose idea was it? How many copies did it sell? How many suicides were linked to its viewing? And that choice of title, Liz Dawn's House Party. Was this meant as a shot across the bow to Noel Edmonds? Imagine if it had really taken off. We might have had duelling house parties on Saturday nights. The BBC with Mr Blobby and Noel's Gunge, opposite ITV, where Bill Tarmy sang heartfelt love songs, and Vera was all, What's to deal with airplane food? It could have been our version of the Monday Night Wars. But as it is, we're left with this, Liz Dawn's house party on VHS, a true one-off. I'm the only woman ever to wear an Easter bonnet parade wearing a baboon's house on my head. <laughs> In fact, a, a fellow whistled at me the other day, you know, in the park. I don't know whether he ever saw his guide dog again. <laughs> I don't go to beauty park, just for a touch. <laughs> Well, I usually go on a Monday and I come out on a Wednesday. <laughs> I just don't know how you manage to keep your youth. Okay. Keep them in the wardrobe. <laughs> your move, EastEnders. Your move. <laughs>